Well, good evening. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that your promise is to be here with us. So, Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit. Lord, you would fill this place, fill this building with your presence, with your glory. God, as we worship you, Jesus, as we lift your name high, Lord, be blessed. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for this first song. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am Father, your love makes us sing, but Lord, 
what a joy it is, what a pleasure it is, what a, a privilege it is to worship you and, and just to be your child, Lord, just to stand here in your presence and to love you and to sing your praises and to acknowledge what an awesome God you are. We love you, Father, and we thank you for the privilege. Guide us this evening, Lord. Pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. You can be seated. A couple of quick announcements. Um, we've got the, a Seder dinner coming up uh, in, in a few weeks, and so I encourage you guys to kind of uh, think that through whether you want to come or not. I think it'll be uh, uh, $10 a person or 25 bucks for a family. And so uh, it's a great time to celebrate uh, a Good Friday and, uh, and the, the Passover meal together and everything else. A lot of symbolism in it, and I'm uh, looking forward to that time. And then um, uh, Resurrection Sunday is coming, so it's uh, the best holiday of the year. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. And um, uh, that's it. Thank you, Father, for, uh, for blessing us tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship you. We ask truly that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. can separate even if I ran away your love never fails I know I still make mistakes but you have new mercy for me every day and your love never fails Sing, nothing can separate. Nothing can separate. Even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercy for me every day. Your love never fails And you stay the same And you stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes with the morning Oh, 
thank you that you do great things, that you are our hero, Lord. You have defeated death. You have conquered the grave. And we are the recipients of that. Lord, I pray that all that we do, every breath, would be for your glory.
Gracious Father, it's all those things that we, we lay at your feet now. Father, we ask that you would just receive what we have, what we are, or all that we offer to you, and that it would be a pleasing sacrifice in your sight. Guide us this evening, Lord, even. Lord, help us to hear your voice. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, why don't you turn and say hello to each other real quick. Yeah. All right, good to be here tonight. Looking like we'll uh, probably finish off Ephesians chapter 4. And so uh, we'll read the chapter together, then we'll, uh, we'll get to it. But uh, if you will, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And once you get your Bibles open, if you're able, uh, would you stand with me? The Bible talks about the blessings that come to those that are reverent to God. And so our attempt is to be reverent to him. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning at verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, to all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by, the, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. <coughs> Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work on all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Gracious Father, we thank you for this awesome exhortation, this, this incredible 
instruction, Lord, and, and we pray that you would help us to, to understand every bit of it. Lord, that we'd walk away with treasure in our hearts uh, from you. And so teach us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. <coughs> well, uh, last week we, we kind of got through um, uh, a chunk, but in, in, in verses 17 and 18 it talks about, you know, from this point forward, you know, from henceforth, uh, don't walk, don't live, don't, you know, live your life essentially the way the world does that. And, and it kind of lays out uh, what happens in that, you know, the futility of their mind and their understanding being darkened and, and being ignorant and blind and, and past feeling, you know, desensitized. And that sounds like a miserable life, you know. Uh, that, that sounds pretty rough, actually, uh, pretty ignorant, uh, living literally, you know, in darkness. But then in verse 20, we come to this contrast. He says, but you've not so learned Christ. I love that. You know, he, he's given us so much more than the bad things we just read about and, and maybe the life that we came from before we knew the Lord, but he's given us so much. And the question might be, what does it mean to have learned Christ? You know, it's a whole different way of life. And uh, in, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8, it says, uh, we are of God. Uh, he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. But this we know, that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love uh, does not know God, for God is love. And so one of the first things that, that John says there, <coughs> I think in answering that question, what it is to have learned Christ, is that, he who knows God hears us. And what he's saying is, if you really know God, then you're going to be receptive to the Word of God. You know, when he says, he that hears us, meaning those who know God are receptive to God's Word. And secondly, those who are of God are loving and manifest His love to others. And, and it's just a, a couple of simple, real, real kind of simple things. Um, manifesting His love to other people. Uh, Jesus told His disciples in, in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this, all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. And, you know, sometimes if you, you watch people, and you can see them ministering to other people, and, and, and you just watch their countenance, the way they're doing it. You know, sometimes, you know, we can minister to people, so, you know, so to speak, but have kind of a crummy attitude. <laughs> you know, we can have kind of a chip on our shoulder, or we can have like, you know, ah, i got to do this or whatever. That's not really loving people. Even if it's the same action, like you, 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 you take them a plate of food, you know, and here in Jesus' name, you know, like, yeah, right. I, I think attitude is everything, you know, and if we're serving our Lord, we should be joyful. Uh, we should be uh, uh, looking to how to do it the best way we can do it and, and ministering in his name because we're representing him. But that's one of the litmuses that we, that we love people. God's a people God, you know, uh, and, and he, he loves people. But the contrast here, he says, you have not so learned Christ. The practicality is that we should be doing the opposite of what we read about in verses 18 and 19. You know, uh, as it says in those other verses, the, the world is insensitive and ignorant of the things of the Spirit, right? So the opposite of that is that we should be aware and sensitive to the things of the Spirit, to the leading and the guiding of the Spirit. Uh, we shouldn't be ignorant, we should be knowledgeable. And, you know, that's one of the, the mainstays of our fellowship is that we spend a lot of time studying the Bible because we don't want us to be ignorant, do we? You know, we want to know what's going on. And, and it's amazing to me how many, you know, well-intending Christians that you'll, you'll end up talking to from different places and different walks of life and stuff, and you'll be talking about some of the basic things of, of the Bible, and they just look at you like, wow, you know, how did you know that? Well, it, it's in the Bible, you know, and... and you know, you'd be talking about stuff where they'll come to you for counsel and says, whoa, man, wh 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 how do you know that? It's in the Bible. And, and it's like so many people that they, they're Christians, but they don't take the time to read their Bible. They don't take the time to study the Bible. And there's, sadly, there's pastors that they don't teach the Bible and churches that don't really emphasize that. But when you do emphasize that and when you are understanding and knowledgeable, you begin to know who God is and what he expects of us. And we get a better grip on what we're supposed to do in life. You know, I don't mind being told what to do, especially when it's God, because I like the instruction. 
I like, no, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I'm going to do this, you know. I hate walking into a scenario and it's just like, uh, I don't know, you know, and you start just kind of doing what you think you got to do. But sometimes there's a lot of comfort when the Word of God gives you clear direction, you know. And so uh, we're supposed to be sensitive to and, uh, and aware of the things of the Spirit. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, uh, but the natural man, and you talk about the, the non-believer, uh, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know, these things, in a sense, are hidden from their eyes because they just don't understand, they don't get it. And I want to be spiritually discerning. I want to understand the things of the Spirit and, and be able to divide the Word of God, you know, the, the, the Word of truth correctly. And, and so we're called to uh, understand these things. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, a little bit uh, towards the end of this chapter, Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed uh, for the day of redemption. And so how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Uh, primarily through uh, disobedience and rebellion. You know, when, when, when you're in a situation and you're about to do something and all of a sudden you just feel this, 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 this check in your spirit, this kind of red flag kind of pops up. And you realize, I shouldn't be here, or I shouldn't be doing this. And instead of reacting to the Spirit, responding to the Spirit, being sensitive to the Spirit, you just stay there and keep doing it. Versus, ah, I don't want to be part of this conversation, or I don't want to be part of this activity, you know, and then moving on. You know, because the Spirit will lead us and guide us, uh, navigate, if you will, for us uh, through these different things. And we don't want to grieve the Spirit of God. We want to be yielded to what the Spirit of God will lead us to. The second thing that's mentioned in verses uh, 18 and 19 is, is that they'd given themselves over to lewdness. Uh, so we would, so we should keep, we should seek after holiness and righteous living. Again, it, we've not so learned Christ. We're going to do the opposite of what, you know, in a sense, the world does. And so we're going to seek after and pursue after righteous living. You know, doing the right thing essentially. Uh, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I, I know that there's, there's the liberties that we enjoy in Christianity. I know that there's freedoms that we have, but never the freedom to sin. You know, there, there's freedom of discussion of different kinds of things, and, and, and we can talk about some of that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think the, the, the church in general, in many ways, has kind of gotten away from righteous living and holiness. You know, and not that we have to mandate stuff and make laws and rules and, you know, turn into Baptists and stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, because, you know, the, I say that because they're kind of known for being somewhat legalistic. Um, I, I could say the same thing about other denom denominations. I don't think we have to have, you know, the, the church, um, you know, SWAT team or, you know, the guys that come check on you and that kind of junk. But there's something about the Holy Spirit speaking to us because I believe the Holy Spirit, as we are growing and maturing as Christians, will point things out in our lives and in an and, and area around us. You should start doing this. You ever see this person that you know, needs help? Why don't you help them? Or why don't you stop doing this or that? This is not honoring to me. And I've spent my whole Christian life learning the things that God likes and learning the things that God dislikes. And sometimes it's at the weirdest moments. I'm in the middle of watching a movie, and the Lord just speaks to me, goes, hey, what you're watching right now is not good. And that, that's time to turn the TV off or the movie off or whatever and, and, and change direction. And, I, you know, when we signed up for this, when we said, Lord, <laughs> you can be my Lord, that means like our parents, you can say, okay, I don't want you watching that TV program. You know, and so turn the TV off. But it, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> seeking to honor him and not live the way the world lives and, and to live our lives differently. I think one of the, the best indications or indicators of a, a solid Christian life is that you can look back at your testimony of learning and change and, and adapting to, to, to the Holy Spirit and to God's Word, you know, that your life is different today than it was when you first got saved. If your life is the same today as when you first got saved, and you've got to kind of, in a certain sense, wonder if you're saved. And, you know, I don't mean to throw that out there like a big old hardball or anything, but, 
Uh, there's people that, yeah, I, I've accepted Jesus, and they're just going to keep living the same old life. And God has not called us to the same old life. He's called us, and one of the things he's called us to, I think, is uh, a degree of personal holiness. You know, in, in Micah 6, 8, uh, he has shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? That means he requires something, <laughs> okay? Uh, but to do justly, do the right thing, and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You know, there are things that God calls us to. And um, the other thing we see in those other verses is that they're seeking to work in uncleanness with greediness, okay? So we seek to do good works in the name of Jesus and to honor him. Uh, and again, he, what's he called us to? He's called us to something different. He's called us to do the opposite of what the world does. And so uh, we're not going to, you know, uh, work uncleanness. We could, I won't describe all that. Or greediness or for self-glorification, uh, but we're, we're, we're work, do good works in the name of Jesus to honor him and to bring glory to him. <clears throat> Jesus taught us that in uh, Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus did so many cool things. I mean, the miracles he did and the lives that he touched, but more often than not, when, when you read those accounts in the Gospels and in the book of Acts and stuff, when Jesus is walking away from it, they're glorifying his Father in heaven. He could, he could raise a dead man, and you'd think the whole world would be looking at Jesus, but they, they, they were praising the God in heaven. When he cleansed the leper, they were praising the God in heaven. And, and we have to adapt our style or our, our, mo our mode of operation or whatever it is so that we would do good works in his name in such a way that he would be glorified. And that's what he's called us to. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, just a couple of chapters back from where we're at, uh, Paul writes, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But the, verse 10 is the kicker. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, he, he planned, he, he knew the day that we would get saved, and he knew the ministry and the mission that he would have for us when we got saved. I love that. We've got purpose. And so part of our job, if you will, is to understand what our purpose is before the Lord and to do that. You know, so many people, they're like an octagonal peg and they want to shove themselves into a, a square hole. And if God's made you a square peg, then, then fit into the square hole. And if he's made you a round peg, fit into the round hole. Instead of trying to shove ourselves into a, a, a life or a vocation or a calling that we're not necessarily called to. And so it's important that we understand what we're called to, make your calling and your election sure. But, you know, I guess the question is, as he, as he says there, uh, you've not so learned Christ. The question might be, have you learned Christ? <laughs> I mean, uh, has he impacted our lives? You know, what proof, if you will, could we offer uh, that we're Christians or, or that we've been changed? And uh, James kind of addresses this in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. He says, Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, actions do speak louder than words. You know, and I, I've, I meet people all the time that, you know, at, at times, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a born-again Christian. I love Jesus, you know, and, and it's always, I was there in the tent days, you know. And it's like, it's like yeah, right, we were all there in the tent days. But uh you know, there's people that talk a lot about those kinds of things, but then do their lives reflect that? And I, and I pray that our lives would reflect that. You know, John writes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. <laughs> That's pretty hardcore. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? I mean, check out the first part of that. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. He's, and I don't mean an intentional liar, uh, and I'm just reading God's word. It's not, not what I intend anyway, but, but I, I think that person is just self-deceived. They don't understand really the love of God. And so our God is a people person, and he calls us to love one another. In verse 21, he says, If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus... And, and so the first few words of that, uh, if indeed you have heard him. And, and Jesus has said that this was a proof that we're really his, uh, that we hear him. 
in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus declares, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But my sheep hear my voice. Uh, the indication that we've heard him is the action f of following him. You know, and if we've been taught by Jesus, is what this is saying, then it should be evident in some way. You know, at one point when uh, uh, the apostles were arrested by the religious leaders because they were preaching Jesus in the temple, and they were listening to them and watching them, and at one point they marveled because these were, quote-unquote, uneducated men. Then you see the comment in there, but then they realized that these men had been with Jesus for three years. The fact that they'd been in communion with Jesus, in contact with Jesus, hearing his words, being instructed, being taught by Jesus at the end of that, that time period when they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they're in the temple, they're in, it essentially, sounds bad to say this, but in enemy territory, surrounded by foes, by critics. They were preaching the gospel with such force and with such conviction that these, these men who, who judge these things stood back and realized, wow, these are just a bunch of ordinary guys, but they hung out with some, a very powerful person. They, hung out, they were in the presence of Jesus, and it impacted their lives, and they acknowledged it. And I pray that our lives would be like that, that, that as we hang out with Jesus, as we spend time with him in prayer, in our devotions, and in, 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 in Bible studies, and, and, and just walking with him and talking with him, that we would look and sound different from the world and that people will take note that we've been with Jesus. So if indeed you've heard him, you know, my sheep hear my voice. Um, if we've been taught by Jesus, it, it'll be evident. Obedience to God's word is the truest hallmark of Christianity. People, what's it take to be a Christian? What's, what's the sign you look for? I mean, you know, if you read some of the, uh, uh, the, the books about the end times and the rapture, and there's a, a time where there's a mark on people. Don't you wish there was like a Christian mark? Like if someone's really Christian, they're going to be bing, and this you know, thing lights up on your forehead. And be like, sweet, I want to hang out with the, those guys. But we don't have anything like that, do we? And we can't really judge each other's you know, salvation or not, those kinds of things. It's, it's very hard to tell sometimes, but you know what? It's easy to tell when someone is so in love with Jesus and so on fire for him that they're just being obedient to his word and they're serving him and they're walking in his ways. And if his, and if his word says it, they do it. And it's just, it's kind of amazing sometimes how other Christians will criticize that. Well, they're too hardcore. <laughs> oh, well, you know, don't get off the porch then, just stay there. <laughs> but it's like, you know, obedience. Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, this is John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> In John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I'll be, I'll be real to him. But the, the litmus oftentimes is just simply being, you know, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. Just do what you know to do. That's all he's calling for. And as you're faithful in the small things, he'll give you more. He'll give you bigger things. As you study your Bible more and you seek to know him more, and, and you've got a heart that's willing to learn, <clears throat> and to uh, willing to allow your life to be changed, allowing your, your person, your heart to be changed, he will reveal himself to you more and more and more and more, and you're, you're going to this deeper and deeper and deeper place with the Lord, and it's not like you're not competing with anybody else. It's just that you on a personal level want to be so close to God. And the way that impacts our lives is we just start doing what he says in a natural kind of way because we love him. It's just because we love him. And he's acknowledging that that is love. That when you're obedient to my word, that's the expression of love that I'm looking for. That's the affirmation I'm looking for. And it's just one of these kind of snowballing things that really <clears throat> does get out of hand after a while. It's kind of radical. James tells us in James 1.25, But who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I remember hearing the quote <clears throat> from... Um, Augustine, uh, or St. Francis, one of those guys, um, these, these younger monks came to him at one point, and I asked him, how do you know what to do? I mean, how do you know the, really you know, the will of God? And he said, you know what? You just love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Then do whatever you want. 
And you think about that. When you love Jesus so totally that he is your life, that he is the one you really, really want to please, and he's your priority in life, and, and as he's changing you and you know, conforming you more and more in his image and all those different kinds of things, what are you going to want to do? <laughs> You're not going to want to go out, you know, carousing and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You're going to want to spend time with him. And, and as you spend time, more time with him, he's going to influence you and, and rub off on you. And, and you're going to find yourself talking like him and thinking like him and, and acting like him. You know, and, and that's a cool thing. But you're going to do whatever you want. What do Christians do for fun? I mean, I've heard that question for so many non-believers. So what do you Christians do for fun? Oh, we hang around and we pray all night long. You know? <laughs> well, some people do, and it is a blast. I tell you what, the guys that gather on Wednesday mornings and Friday mornings, that's the fastest hour I live all week. It just it, it blows by. And, you know, we get done. And it's kind of funny. It doesn't matter if we've got five minutes to go or, or, or 30 seconds to go. But it seems like we always end at just the right time. It's just like, bing, well, on time. But it's like, I'm always surprised at how, how fast it goes. And it's a thrill. Because sometimes guys will bring, you know, we pray for some, some things and some people pretty consistently. And we, we pray for the salvation of my dad and my, my uncles and my brothers and my sister all the time. So we pray for some things, you know, pretty consistently. And I'm, I'm very hopeful. But there's some things that come in, you know, it's every now and then somebody brings something to the table that's just like different. You know, someone's sick or someone's having surgery or some, some issues happening. And it's like, it's a, just a, you know, just a different thing. And so we all pray for it. And it's exciting because we can hardly wait till next week. Well, what happened? You know, well, nothing yet. Then two weeks later, someone will walk to the door. Hey, by the way, that thing we prayed about, they were healed or, or they got the job or the baby's okay or, you know, and, and, and it's like, yeah. And what's that make you want to do? Makes you want to pray more. But to a non-believer watching that from the outside, they go, whoa, boring. But to us, it's exciting because we see God moving. And when you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and strength, you don't want to do the weird things or the sinful things so much. And that's why you can kind of be turned loose in a certain sense to just do whatever you want to do because what you want to do is please Him. And there's so many different ways to do that. But look at the last part of that verse. It says, If indeed you've heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus... Now, you guys have all heard the verse, you know, John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I've told you before that, you know, when people ask me, how, you know, what is truth? You know, how do you, like Pilate's question, what is truth? You know, cynicism. And I've come to understand, because I've, I've had different definitions of the truth, but the one I've landed on is that Jesus is the truth. And so it's anything that's consistent with the person and the character of Jesus. But when you read a statement like this that says, if you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, how much of the truth is in Jesus and how is Jesus in the truth and how do you separate the two? And if we've been taught by him, it becomes part of what we are just as the truth is in Jesus. When we've been taught the truths of God and we understand the essence of who he is and, and what he's trying to communicate to us and it becomes real in us and, and it becomes part of us, it's always there. How do you separate Jesus from the truth or the truth from Jesus? You can't. And when you've been taught by the Lord and, and you've tasted and seen that he's good and you've experienced his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness and his love has washed over your life, how do you take that out of your life? How do you separate yourself from that? And so when we're taught and we're instructed by him and he teaches us these things that he's teaching us that we... <clears throat> have heard him and been, been taught by him, it can't be taken away. They can rip this jacket off my back. They can take my car away from me. They can take my life from me, but they can't take the truth of Jesus Christ away from me. They can't take the love of God out of me. It's there. And it's what we're called to be. And that's how we're called to walk. And we're called to walk differently. Not to be conformed to this world. Not to look like this world. I mean, people aren't going to come to us because we look like them. They're not going to come to us because we're doing their life better than they're doing their life. 
They're going to come to us because they've given up on their life. And they're looking for something different. And they're looking for something that works. They're looking for something that's real. And the only thing that works and the only thing that's really real is Jesus himself. So have we learned Christ? That's what he's calling us to. He's calling us to something way different than the rest of the world knows. Just as the truth is in Jesus, he being true to his own person, to his own character, because he is the truth. And I pray that we wouldn't just be a follower of Jesus in the sense that, yeah, we're following Jesus, that, that he is, he's not just where we, the guy that we visit on Sundays and Wednesdays, but that he is the only truth that we know and he's what we crave to be with. And I want to hear him and, and walk with him and, and we don't ever want to be separated from him, that he is our life and that we are truly inseparable from him. It's a different life, but it's an awesome life. It's walking in the light. It's walking with understanding. It's, you, you go back to verses 18 and 19, look at verse 17, the futility of their mind. We see that all around us. But we have purpose. We have understanding. We, we understand things in this world that a lot of this world doesn't understand. If I was to bring in some, some politicians that we all know and sit them down in the front row and say, let's talk about life for a minute. Let's talk about some important things. They're going to have some very different answers from, from what we know and believe because we're, we're grounded in God's word. And our eyes are actually open. Theirs are, theirs are closed and they're deceived. And I love knowing the truth. Then it takes us to the next step. <clears throat> because this is part of a process. If indeed you've heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, then there are certain things in verse 22 that as it st states that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. In a couple of verses, we're going to talk about what we put on. But it, it's the acknowledgement, because some people say, well, you're being legalistic, man. No, the Bible says that when you, can't, you become a Christian, there are certain things that you're going to cast aside. There are certain things that you're going to put off, stop doing, stop living, because now you're a different creature in Christ Jesus. Oh, you're just hung up on religion, man. No, I'm not. I'm hung up on wanting to please my God. <laughs> I'm hung up on wanting to just walk with him and to hear him. And he doesn't want to hang around. I mean, he loves us. When we get saved, he loves us the way we are. But I'm so glad that he doesn't leave us the way we are, that we begin to change. And so he says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt. Corrupt is a way of saying decay even decomposing like a dead body, okay, which grows corrupt according to the de deceitful lusts. <laughs> Ever pursued after a lust that let you down? Ever pursued after a lust that when you got there, it's like, hey, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> that's not what I thought it would be, because why? It was deceitful. Because the enemy meant boozled us. And, and he's saying, don't waste your time chasing those stupid things. It's not real. The, the biggest issue with pornography, guys get all wound up and chase after all this stuff, and it's not real. It's so fake. And then when they have an encounter with a real person, go, it wasn't like, and go, it's never going to be. It's like watching, it's like watching the Avengers or, or one of those movies. Do you think people really twirl around five times before they kick somebody? Do you really think that? I mean, I've been in lots and lots of fights, and I tried doing one of those things one time, and I ended up breaking a wrist because I drop kicked somebody running down an alley that stopped. And, oh, yeah, I got you. Superman. And the Batman move didn't work. It's not real. And people get so easily deceived by dumb stuff. And so we're being called to put off concerning your former conduct, the old life. Why? Because we're called to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're called to live a different life. Uh, I love that verse that we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I love being called out of darkness. 
Paul wrote to the Romans in, in Romans 6, 4, he said, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, sh we, we also should walk in what? The newness of life. Do not walk in the old ways. I tell you, that's, that's something that puts me in check every now and then. I, I, I want to be a godly husband and a godly father to my kids. I want to be uh, a, a godly pastor and a good example to you guys. But I, I put my shoes on one shoe at a time and my pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. And there's times when I get caught up in stuff and I realize, and I, and I can tell, when I start doing or thinking the old way, you know, when I, I, it, and, it, and I think the Lord even kind of lets me kind of get there sometimes just so I can realize how much I need him. But it's a check. And, and the Holy Spirit right there stops me. Says, Do you really want to go back to the old way? <laughs> because I, I don't want to dwell on the past. I don't want to talk about my bragamony and all those kinds of things. But I remember that lost feeling. I remember the hopeless feeling that I had before I knew Jesus. I remember doing, working hard and doing the same thing over and over and over again. My partner and I would sit down to dinner and we're going to get we're going to get busted, we're going to get caught, we're going to get, you know, whatever, and uh, if we keep doing this, you know, <laughs> they're going to put handcuffs on us. And we got to turn over a new leaf. And so we'd, we'd make an oath together. Okay, we're not, you know, we're, we're just not going to go to these places, we're not going to do these certain things. And it would last two or three days. And we'd be chasing some guy into a house or doing the different things, you know, and it's like a week later we forgot everything we vowed. And I went through that cycle more times than I can tell you. And I realized at one point that I, I just can't do it. I, I, thought I, was, I thought I was a man of self-control. I thought I was a man of discipline. I thought that the things I was doing I could control. And as I'm, as I'm having this conversation with myself, I realize I'm no different than a heroin addict or a, a rock dog who thought that they could control it, who thought that they could handle it, who thought that they could do the thing. And you get to the place at one point when you realize you can't. And... and the question you've got to ask yourself, and I had to ask myself, do I want to keep doing this this way? <laughs> because it's really stupid. <laughs> and I'm going to burn myself. And so I want to walk in the newness of life. The new man, ruled and guided by the Spirit, putting off the ways of the flesh, you know, being, not, no longer being ruled by the flesh, but being ruled by the Spirit. That's what I want. And we've got these different... Um, <clears throat> You know, it says put off. We could make a good long list. We could get together and make ourselves and just compile a great list, but the Bible has several of these already. <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 3 and 4, but fornication <clears throat> and, and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not once be named. And, there, and, and I, I, love, I underline that phrase, once, not once be named, because it, it describes a zero tolerance. I know he's a God of grace. I know he's a God of mercy. But when he says, let it not once be named among you, he's not saying, well, you know, best two out of three would be okay. He's saying, this is the standard. Never. Never. Not once. God draws lines in the sand. Let it not once be named among you, as is fitting the saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But are we crucified with Christ? Are we dead to sin? I know we struggle with that. I do. But that's what he's called us to. So the put-offs versus the put-ons. There are a few different listings in the Bible, again, that we can look to for direction, put off the works of the flesh. In uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, I, it's, it's kind of funny, I misquoted this a few times, um, because you know, I think about the fruit of the Spirit, so I thought, well, the fruit of the flesh. But it's not the fruit of the flesh, it is the result of the flesh, but the works of the flesh is how it's worded. Now, the works of the flesh are these, uh, <coughs> are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, 
uh, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, which I tell you before, just as I've told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> that, that straightens me up sometimes, will not inherit the kingdom of God. If that's our lifestyle, we're toast. Paul says the same thing basically in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. I won't read it to you, but it's uh, pretty similar. But 2 Timothy chapter 3 <clears throat> says something, and, uh, and I'll read this to you only because it's, uh, it's uh, so, it describes our culture. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. He says, and from such people turn away. That last part always gets me, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There are, are Christians, people that go to church that love pleasure more than they love God. They love the this or the that, the things that they want to do more than God and have a form of godliness, but really denying the power thereof. These are the put-offs. These are the things that we're supposed to cast aside. And I have to tell you, it shouldn't be a begrudging, oh, no, i got to get rid of it. You know, it, it, it should be like no contest. <laughs> There's people that struggle. Oh, you know, it's like, no, it should be like, chuck that sucker and put it behind you, and you, 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 know, you should be glad to get rid of it because it's going to kill you anyway. And then the transition that we're making from verse 21 now, uh, I'm sorry, 22 to 23, and eventually getting to 24, 23 is, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It, it, it starts by being willing to be a living sacrifice. Uh, and, and, and as a sacrifice, it's really from a, a position of gratitude. God, I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. I'll do anything for you. I will die for you. You know, Peter made that comment. Lord, I, I, I'm not like these other guys. I'm willing to go to death for you. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of said it in an emotional way. I, I would die for my wife. I would die for my kids. But Jesus is the only one that calls us on it. You really, you love me that much? You would die for me? There's the altar. Oh, you, oh, you got to go play baseball instead. Oh, you've got to, you know, go. You said you'd die for me. The altar's right there. On top, that's where you belong. We mean it or we don't. You know, I beseech you, brethren, Romans 12, 1, <clears throat> I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. It is reasonable in light of what he has done for us. But, I mean, if we're going to place our lives on the altar, if we're going to be a living sacrifice, that means we are going to die. I'll put that another way. You're not always going to get what you want. It's not about our happiness. Some people think that Christianity, that the main focus is about our happiness, and it's not. It's about our salvation. It's about our soul. It's about our time with Jesus. It's about being with him forever in heaven. <clears throat> but that does not always necessarily equate to happiness here on earth. We are going to go through hard times. We're going we're to have struggles. And he has to still be our priority no matter what. I read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it's humbling to see guys that, an executioner that, that sees Christians in a, in a processing line, getting their heads chopped off and being killed or being tortured, and he's watching their faith, and these, these Christians say, well, I love you, Jesus, I belong to you, and they climb up on the altar, and they have their head cut off, or their, their different things happen to them, and the executioner that watches that goes, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And the executioner that lays his axe down and then puts his head on the stump and says, I will receive Jesus too. I will die for my Lord. And he's been a Christian for five minutes. It's like, wow. 
has a right perspective. But reasonable sacrifice, reasonable in light of what he's done for us, a reason truly I think that's born out of gratitude, <clears throat> but it progresses to having a new understanding and a new way of thinking. When I was a kid growing up during the, uh, the Cold War, people talked about brainwashing and the, the commies would brainwash people, you know, and, and I thought, oh, that's really bad. And then I realized after I became a Christian that that's exactly what I need. I just don't want the commies to do it. <laughs> I, want, I want Jesus to do it, you know, and, and, and it, it might have to put me on a double agitator or something, you know, to get, get it really clean, put me in the spin cycle. But I want to be brainwashed. I want to see life differently. I want to understand things differently. Paul tells the Romans in Romans 12 too, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But we have to think differently. And we have to train our minds to think differently. We all grew up a certain way. And there are certain things that when they happen, we just kind of instinctively react. You know, I'll be honest with you, when, when, when people would yell at me, I would get mad because I grew up being yelled at. And I really didn't like it. And, and talk about a trigger for me. When I was a cop, I'm, I was great with people right up till they yelled at me. <laughs> and then it was like rage. <clears throat> and the Lord had to really do a work in me. Sometimes my kids will see me get angry now and things will happen and I know it concerns them when it happens. But, but I sit back sometimes and I go, well, I'm just glad you didn't see me 30 years ago. I'm glad none of you saw me 30 years ago either. <laughs> but the Lord has been working in my heart and working in my mind. And I now can tell you this day, I, I'm, not, I'm not a finished product, but I receive information differently. I perceive information differently. I, I process it differently. I think differently. Because he's been doing this restorative work. I think it's a, a recalibration and a reset back to what it should have been back in the day, Adam's day perhaps, I don't know, to the day of the Lord, and in that process, we begin to understand what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we're able to discern this, to understand this in a way that the rest of the world doesn't and can't and never will until they're filled with the Holy Spirit and their mind begins to change and they begin to understand things. And what I'm really talking about, just to simplify it, is a biblical worldview that we now view life through the lens of the Bible. If I didn't have my Bible in front of me, I would not understand what's going on in the Middle East. If I didn't have my Bible in front of me, I wouldn't understand what's going on in California. I mean, you look at the, the different laws and, and the, the liberalism and transgenderism and all the different strange things that you look at, and, and I know you're thinking, you understand that? No, I don't. I didn't say I like it, but I do understand where we're headed and why. Because the Bible says it has to be like this. It has, to, it has to get worse and worse and worse until the day when the Lord comes back, until the world's snapped out of here. And so I, I don't necessarily like how it's going, but I do take some comfort in knowing, even though I can't seemingly stop it, it's going to go this way, but when it gets to a certain point, the Lord's going to call his children out of it, then he's going to let everybody rot in it for seven years, and then he's going to come back and just clean it up. But it's a process that has to take place. And you, you, could, you could be very cynical or you could be just fed up or you could be just like, oh man, you know, when's this going to be over? I don't know, but it'll be a multiple of seven. Because <laughs> God's going to take care of it. So we're not being conformed to this world, but we're, we're being conformed into his image, transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what I want to point out to you as well as we get into verse uh, 24, it's not enough to not do bad things. What you're going to see as we go through the rest of this, we have to do good things. We can't be a church or a people that are known for what we're against. You know, we're against homosexuality, we're against this, we're against that. I don't want to be known for what I'm against. I want to be known for who I am for and what I am for. I am for Jesus and I am for righteousness 
and I am for my God in every way. And, and so that manifests itself in different ways. I am for loving people. I am for helping people, for ministering to people. And that may very well mean ministering to people that we don't agree with their lifestyle. That's great. I wish that some of the, the, the people that, you know, some of the, as an example, just maybe some of the homosexuals in our community that hate church, I wish they would come to church one day and just sit and listen and, and see what it's really all about if they, could, if they could take that time. But it's not enough to do, not to do bad things. We have to do good things, and we're, we're getting towards that. In verse 24, he says, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. <clears throat> Putting on the new man. Created in God as a new creature. You know, um, nature abhors a vacuum. And, I, and I've watched this with people that are addicted to heroin and, and alcohol and different things over the years. It's not enough to just stop drinking. It's not enough to just stop doing your drug or whatever. By sheer willpower, I'm going to stop. And you, you create maybe a, a little void in your life. You've got to fill that. You can't just stop drinking. You can't just stop using drugs or doing whatever it is. You've got to start doing something else. You've got to fill that time. You've got to fill that void because it is nature of horrors of void. In the spiritual realm, there's no such thing as a void. You're either going to be filled with the Spirit of God or you're going to be spirit, filled with the Spirit of this world and you will be filled with something, period. You will not be, a, there's no such thing as a void in the spiritual realm. Jesus explains this to us. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 12, verses uh, 43 through 45, he said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I, I'm going to return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Then he says, so shall, so shall it be with this wicked generation. So that the spirit that's possessed a man gets tired of being there for whatever reason. He leaves. That man now is like, oh, I'm going to clean up my act. And how many alcoholics do we all know or drug addicts that finally get to a point and say, I'm going to clean up my act. And that by sheer willpower, they stop doing whatever they were doing. And they, they, they clean up the room. They throw all the bottles out. They, they, they shave. They clean up all this different junk. And it goes on for a little while. But the whole thing has been about not doing a certain thing. And it, it's just a matter of time. I, I've watched it, I'm not kidding you, thousands of times with people that stop doing certain things. They, they, they turned over a new leaf. They, they're they're going to will themselves so, sober or whatever. And for a season it works. Then something happens. And whether it's a friend offers them something or they get a, a hard bad news about something or a hundred things, and they go, well, just one drink. <laughs> right back into it, hard and worse than before. I'm just going to take one slam. I'm just going to take one hit. And that's when I find them wrapped around a toilet in, a, in, in the bathroom at the gas station. That's when you find them in an alley, you know, because they, they one more time, and it's worse, and it's worse. Because you can't stop just doing those things. You've got to fill that. And I say fill it with the things of the Spirit. You've got to fill it with Jesus. I've, I've, I've arrested literally thousands and thousands of heroin addicts, and I watched so many of them try to get off and go to programs, all kinds of stuff. And the only guys that I ever, ever saw get off heroin or off methamphetamine were the guys that gave their hearts and their lives to Jesus. So they, they threw that bad thing away. They, they put it off, like it says here, you know, put off concerning your former conduct, and they put on Jesus. And when they put on Jesus and allow him to dwell in them and allow him to, to guide them through life, and they're filled with the Spirit, those are the guys that are sober. Those are the guys that make it in life. And they can, they can look back and go, yeah, man, I, I got a testimony. But Jesus. And it's always the, all the bad things, but Jesus. And he saved me. And he filled that void because we have, if, we, if we put off, you have to put him on. You can't not put on. And as you go through the rest of this chapter, I started marking because in verse 22, it's got the put off. In verse 24, it's got the put on. And then he gives us one, two, three, four, five, six more examples after that. And every single example is a put off and then the corresponding put on. 
there's, there's a tactic <laughs> uh, to the rest of this chapter. And it's all about verses 23, uh, 22, 23, and 24. Put off and put on. And, and it's the idea, <clears throat> as we put on the new man, that we have a new mindset. Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I want the mind of Christ. It, it's thinking about the right things. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8, you know, be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. Now, let me ask you, when you go through your day, and this happens to me, uh, the enemy plays mind games on me and the attacks and stuff, and I can get so angry and, 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 and turn and just spiral down. <clears throat> and if I keep thinking about that, that's exactly what will happen. But we are sovereign creatures. We can actually choose what we think about. Now, it may be overwhelming if you're facing a big thing. And it's like, I can't get it out of my mind. But you know what? When you do what he says, and finally, brother, whatever things are true, think about what's true. That's Jesus, his word. Whatever things are honest, we're going to bring it back to Jesus. Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things have a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, he says, think on these things. He didn't say try to think. He said think. That means we can do it. He's given us the ability to choose what we think about. We have to take our minds and our thoughts captive. It is so easy for us to, to spiral the wrong direction and, and, and sink deeper and deeper into literally the abyss. But we have to be a different kind of creature. We have to be a new man in Christ Jesus. We have to walk in the light. We have to think in the light. And we have to choose what we're going to think about. That's, that's part of putting on the new man. Now, <clears throat> the first put off in verse 25, it says, therefore putting away lying. Well, that's the put off. And let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor. That's the put on. See the put off and the put on there? The next few verses are all like that. So the first thing to put off is lying. He wants us to speak truth. Why? Because he's the God of truth. Because he, he requires, as it says in Psalm 51, verse 6, he requires truth in the inward parts. By the way, that's how we all got saved. We came to a point one day, whether we spoke it out loud to anybody else or acknowledged it to anybody else or not, we realized that truth in our inward parts, that we are wretched and poor and blind and naked and helpless. I can't fix myself. That was the truth he wanted us to come to. And because we finally came to the truth in the inward parts, that's when we cried out to him. He said, Lord, help me. <clears throat> and he met, he met you right there. I love the, the writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 8, verse 7. He makes this commitment, for my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Wow. Verse 25 again says, therefore put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Here's the reason. For we are members of one another. Members of one another. <clears throat> We're part of the body of Christ. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 12, 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I won't make this a, a long sermon on why we should all come to church, but part of why we should all come to church is because we're a family and we're a body and we're all different parts of that body and every part is needed. And we miss out you know, when we're not connected to the body. And when we lie to each other, we do ourselves harm because we're part of the body of Christ, we're the family of Christ. If I lie to one of you, I'm hurting you because I'm hurting you, I'm hurting me because we're connected. My wife and I and the husbands and wives are, are one flesh. When a husband or a wife hurts their spouse, they're hurting themselves because we're, we're, we're one. You know, uh, I was blown away when I 
studying through Proverbs 24, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, but in Proverbs 24, verse 26, it says, he who gives a right answer kisses the lips. And this is something that's still just resonating in my mind and my heart. But, and, and, and you guys have heard it a couple times already, but uh, who, he who gives a right answer kisses the lips. That's a genuine expression of love and, and, and affection when you're willing to tell someone the truth. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kiss to the lips. But so a wrong answer or a lie is an expression of contempt and hatred. Why would I lie to you? Because I don't respect you? Why would I lie to you? Uh, because um, I think I can get away with it. I don't think you're that smart. I mean, you go down the list when people lie to each other. But it's, it's an expression of contempt because telling the truth is an expression of love. So I see it as just the opposite. In verse 26, he says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. <clears throat> Be angry and do not sin. That's the, the put off. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That's the put on. You see it? Now, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. To me, that's a tall order. I've done a lot of studies on anger. I've, I've walked a lot of different men through studies on anger because that's something that I know, I know it's universal, but it seemed like that's an issue that guys have. You know, sometimes the stereotypical arguments or discussions will be, well, women are so emotional. And I won't argue that. But I tell guys when they tell me that, anger is an emotion. <laughs> you know? And I've seen lots of guys get freaking angry, you know, flipping out, all kinds of stuff over dumb things. And it's like, we've got to keep it in order. But be angry and do not sin. That is a tall order. To be angry and not be in the flesh is not an easy thing to do at times. I think there are times when we can be angry about something, we could recognize something is wrong, and still be walking in the spirit, kind of go, oh, that's not right. But what you do with that from that point forward, because you could be righteously indignant or angry about something, but then what do you do with that? And if you say, you know what, I'm going to fix this, and you, and you write a letter to your congressman, uh, which in California won't do any good, uh, or if you, uh, uh, if you say, I'm going to you know, start a, a movement or this or that, you know, and it motivates you to do, try and you know, fix it or do something, that, I think that's positive. But if you flip out and kick the dog and scream at the kids, I'd say that's negative. And so how do we be angry? Because it doesn't say don't get angry. It says be angry and do not sin. So our, there are things that are going to rile us that way, but we've got to kind of keep a lid on it. You know what I mean? And somehow still be in the spirit. <clears throat> and, and what is the difference between righteous anger and sinful anger? And uh, I'm just going to throw a couple things out there. I'm not the expert on this, and I'm still learning it. But we may recognize a sinful or, or ungodly situation and become righteously angered. I think any time that we digress from simple recognition in our thoughts or to words or deeds uh, which are harmful to anyone else, then it becomes sin. I think that's the point. I mean, because I honestly, and I, and I, I've seen things that go, that's not right. Sometimes you can get kind of angry about that. or I read stuff about what's going on in our schools or the things that are being proposed in California. And I go, that's not right. But if I start cursing the governor and, you know, flipping out and stuff, well, then that's when I've crossed the line. And again, it pr perhaps it's a matter of recognizing the situation for what it is, but still walking in the spirit, not in the flesh. Uh, and, 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 you know, Paul said in Galatians 5.16, I say that if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so somehow to still walk in the spirit while you're seeing that. Uh, we need to recognize when we're in sinful anger and deal with it in a biblical manner. And, and really that means confessing it to God. You know, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to resolve our differences in a, in a biblical way and, and seek forgiveness and restoration in all humility. 
And sometimes that can be a tough thing. The last part of that says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. As I see this, to me, it's simply a, a, a biblical time limit that the things that we're dealing with in our anger at times uh, can't drag on forever. I've had relatives that had feuds amongst themselves for 10, 12, 15 years. It's like, wow. You know, I mean, I, I just don't have the diligence for that. But I mean, he's saying the time limit, like, if, and, I, and I think the context, I'm not sure if it's because it's leading into that, but a lot of times the context is between a husband and a wife. You get into a contentious discussion, uh, and maybe it's not even an argument or whatever, but it's just one of those things that you're kind of going back and forth, back and forth, and not really coming to an agreement. It's kind of like when you, when you have to come to an agreement, somehow you will. And the biblical mandate here is don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Before you go to bed, deal with it. And I remember years ago, my wife and I being up till two or three in the morning talking about stuff. <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, I give up. <laughs> my eyes are going to fall out of my head. Anything, just let me sleep. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I remember. But that's what drives us. Do you know that? <laughs> subject jump, not a subject jump. But do you know why they, when they select a new pope, do you know how they do it? They, they, there's a there's a convent in Italy, and, you know, selecting a new pope, that means he's the most powerful guy in the Roman Catholic Church, and so it's a big deal to them. You know, they select a pope, they gather all the cardinals together, and they put them in this convent, and it's a special room that's made just for doing this. And so they put like 120 cardinals in this room, and then they get a brick mason, and they brick up, seal the door, and nobody's coming out until they've picked a pope. And the way they know is there's a fire, like a little fireplace, and they can take a bunch of leaves and they put it in and the smoke turns white versus being just regular black smoke. And that's how they say, okay, we picked a pope. And I don't know if there was a knife fight. I don't know if, you know, you know what they did in there. But one way or the other, they figure out, okay, whatever it takes, man, you're it. Okay, I, just, I need lunch. <laughs> you know, I don't know. How you, but they've been locked in there sometimes for, for weeks trying to figure out what's happening. And then they find that the smoke turns white, then they come back and they bust down the, the bricks for the door, let them out, and the guy that comes out first wearing the white pointy hat, he's the guy, you know. But I mean, they, they kind of force them. In, in, it's a bad, you know, maybe a bad analogy, but there are times when we need to just have some kind of a limit and you gotta fix this. You ever told your kids, you know, that are fighting, you guys fix this right now. I'll be back in five minutes, and if it's not fixed, I will fix it. And, and that's the context I kind of get in a certain sense, that we need to take care of things. Besides, if you, if you, if you don't do this, like, it, it says there, be angry and do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. If you let the sun go down on your wrath, if you go to bed angry, how are you going to wake up? More than likely, you're going to wake up angry. More than likely, you're going to wake up with a bad attitude or whatever. And, uh, and it's interesting because the very next verse is, nor give place to the devil. Let me ask you this. Do you want the devil spending the night with you? Do you want the devil in your mind all night long while you're trying to sleep? Because this division, the arguments are usually instigated by the enemy in some way, shape, or form. And almost always, if, if, if part of that party will be walking in the Spirit, or if both will, it ends you know, in prayer. And uh, uh, you know, fighting is a bummer, but making up is fun. And the, the, the rejoicing that comes from being un, unified that way. But if you don't do what he's saying, do not let the sun go down in your wrath, you're going to fall into the next verse. Where it says, give no place to the enemy. Give him no place of rest. Don't give him a foothold. Don't let him spend an extra eight hours working on your brain. Deal with it in a biblical way. Because if you don't, the enemy will take that foothold. He'll exploit it. And you're going to give him time to work his diabolical plan in your mind and your heart. You know, do nor give place to the devil. Another of uh, the NASB Bible translate this, and do not give the devil an opportunity. 
which I think is appropriate as well. Give the enemy no quarter, no place, no foothold, no beachhead. If he gets a beachhead, he will exploit it. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12, 15, look carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. A little root of bitterness left in our heart will grow and flourish, and it will defile us, and it will defile those that we're around. We've got to root it out. We've got to deal with it. And the only way to deal with that is to repent of it and ask God to forgive us. You know, um, another verse that kind of cautions me is James chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, James says, For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I don't, um, <clears throat> I don't like to, um, uh, I, I'm not being critical of other, other uh, pastors or teachers, but sometimes people have complained because, hey, Mike, you know, you're kind of like milk toast. You're not very charismatic, you know, and, and I get ex excited never done. You guys know when I get excited, uh, but I don't, I don't like to yell. I don't like to yell at people because I don't like to be yelled at because it comes across sometimes as the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It's like, if I can't just talk to you in plain English and, you know, conversational tones, my animations and, you know, jumping around and stuff isn't going to make any big whoop. But we've got to be careful. And again, this kind of falls back into um, our countenance and dealing with anger. In verse 28, let him who steal or stole, steal no more, uh, no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. So the, the put off, let him not, let him who stole, steal no longer. The put on, uh, working with his hands, what is good. So you, you put off the old and uh, you, you put on uh, the new behavior. And, and this is just not, it's not just an admonition to not steal, but this is a picture of what real repentance looks like. This guy was a thief. This guy was stealing. And now his life is completely changed around, and he's working to help and give to others. That's the opposite. That's so cool. I think it's a great example of repentance. In verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That's the put off. But what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's the put on. One goes off, the other one comes on. You don't just stop saying mean things or profane things or whatever it was. You can't walk around, you know, hand over your mouth or duct tape or whatever. It's like, no, let's, let's look for good things to say, ways to, to build up and to edify and to, to strengthen. And, 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 you know, no corrupt communication. So do the opposite, edify. The word edify is very similar to educate, Okay to minister grace. And, and, and this is the filter through which all of our communications should flow. If you understand what, how a filter works, uh, a, a filter doesn't interrupt or stop the flow. A filter just keeps the bad stuff from going through. And so I need a filter over my mouth. Actually, I need a filter over my heart, then my mouth will be okay. Baby, are you okay? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I lift up my wifey to you. and She's suffering, Lord. I don't understand exactly what's going on, but she doesn't feel good. And Lord, I pray that you would touch her. I pray that you would settle her stomach, Lord, or settle her heart. I pray that you would minister to her. And, and, and Lord, do for her what only you can do, that none of us can. Would you touch her, Father? Would you bring glory to your name? Would you heal her? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you go with your mom and drive her home? Um, so I need a filter over my heart and over my mouth and I want God's word to be that I want Ephesians 4.29 actually to be that four letter words uh, crass speech uh, euphemisms you know there's a lot of Christians that feel very okay using certain words that they're not 
curse words outright, but they're what I would refer to as a euphemism. Um, when someone says, you know, uh, uh, frickin' this or frickin' that, they just didn't want to drop an F-bomb. You hear a lot of Christians use the word crap. What's that mean? It's another word that is more vulgar. And I hate to even say it from the pulpit. I, I apologize if I offended anybody, but there's certain words that should, shouldn't be in our vocabulary. And um, there's no excuse for some of these things. And it's not becoming of a child of God. I think, and, and you know, sometimes how we talk, we have to rethink how we talk. Part of having a new mind, a new understanding of God's will. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, it says, But fornication, all uncleanness, and covetousness, let it not once be named among you, as is fitting the saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. We should be giving of giving thanks. And I, and I mentioned this at the men's conference. I, I, I just looked at the men uh, right in the eye and said, you know what? Um, there's no excuse for men cursing their wives, period. And I know there's Christian guys that get upset. They fly off the handle and they you know, say all kinds of stuff, but there's no excuse for it. We need to be careful how we talk. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, but now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. God cares uh, how we talk. In 2 Timothy 3.16, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. If we're not careful about how we talk, even how we talk, we're, gonna, we're hearing it ourselves. You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The more we speak the Word of God, the more we read the Word of God out loud, it, it has an impact on our faith. But the more that we speak vile and profane things has a way, I think, of tearing down our faith and tearing down our witness and tearing down who we think we are. And it can have an impact the other way too. It, it says there, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We've got to understand there are hearers all around us. There's nothing worse than watching your little three- or four-year-old kid utter some word that you heard from you that you're really glad that the neighbor didn't hear. I remember driving with my son one day, and he rolls the window down, and he cursed at my neighbor, quoting me. Yeah, that was a thrill. I'm just looking at my son like, man, and he got it from me. And imagine the humble pie. <laughs> I don't have to imagine. I lived it, walking over and talking to my neighbor and apologizing for my son's words. I wasn't. Gonna, you know, my son apologized too, but it was like, but I. He learned those words from me. So we got to be careful about the hearers. In verse thirty, it says, um, "Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." Uh, Grieve not the, the Spirit of God, which happens through disobedience and sinful behavior. When we honor God and glorify God through our obedience, uh, He's blessed. But when we profane the name of God, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, and again, I mentioned this earlier, John 14, 15, that you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. And uh, John 14, 21, that He has my commandments and keeps them. He it is that loves me. In verse 31, He says, Put all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. In other words, these things to be cast away, put off. Uh, they are the works and the manifestations of the flesh. And we, we read earlier Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the, the works of the flesh. Then in verse 32, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. <clears throat> so verses 30 and 31 are the put offs. Verse 32 is the put on. Be kind one to another. Do the opposite. And I love these words, these adjectives, <clears throat> these, these verbs, uh, some kind of English word. Uh, kindness, tenderhearted, forgiving. These are cool things. These are fruits of the Spirit. 
These are the put the put ons. Galatians five twenty two through twenty three, the, the fruit of the spirit. There's no prohibition against these things, only an encouragement to do them. <coughs> Kindness, tender heartedness, forgiving. Great. How much? Well, we're told. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Jesus is always the standard. How much did Jesus forgive us? Do you want to go 50% on that? <laughs> no. Even as God in Christ Jesus forgave you, Jesus is the standard. How much? A lot. More than we have. I can tell you the forgiveness that I need to extend is more than I have. So I have to, forg I have to forgive in such a way that I extend the forgiveness of my Lord Jesus. Tenderhearted? Kind? How much? I've only got so much. But I want to give you what he's given me. And so I take his forgiveness, I take his tenderness, I take his goodness, and I extend it to you. And then you guys extend it to me. And we extend it back and forth to each other. And that's what God's called us to do. By this, all will know that you're my disciples by how you have love one for another. And even as God in Christ has forgiven us. That's a lot. But he gives us all that that we need. What an awesome God. Heavenly Father, thank you once again. Thank you for your word. <clears throat> thank you for your love. Thank you for your incredible kindness. And we ask that tonight, Lord, you would help us to, to live these words, to, to live this faith lesson, Lord, in you. And that you would strengthen us by your spirit. Guide us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you're able, let's uh, stand together and, and worship.
thank you, Father, that, that you are the God that restores. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God that forgives and the God that heals and that you are merciful and kind and, and, and loving towards us. Lord, we are your favorite kids and we bask in your love and we, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to work in us and through us, Lord. That you would shape us and mold us and, and, and help our minds to be conformed more into the mind of Christ. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. God bless you guys. Pray you have a, a restful, peaceful night. If you will, keep my wife in prayer. Obviously, she wasn't feeling real good tonight, and uh, she went home sick. But uh, I pray that you guys just uh, rest well, wake up refreshed, and the Lord just continues to speak to your hearts and, and draw you closer to Him. God bless you guys. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. I would love to pray with you.